So good afternoon, everybody. Um, welcome to the uh, uh, an extra seminar this week. Um, we have with us today Professor Efrat Lichit from the Technion in Institute, who's going to be giving an interesting uh, talk on colloidal nanoparticles. Um, uh, Professor Lichit um, uh, holds the Gillsborough Chair at the Technion, um, and she's also uh, uh, got an academic position in the Schulich Institute, uh, um, also based at the Technion. She has been. Uh, she did her. Um, BA, a first degree BA in uh, chemistry at the Hebrew University in Jerusalem and PhD in physical chemistry in the University of Michigan. And she's, over the last 30 years, she's held many different, or several different academic positions at the University of Michigan, the Wiseman Institute, and also at the Technion. She's been visiting pre professor at many different institutions, and including at present, she's currently a visiting professor at um, the Fraunhofer ISE, of course we know them well, and also at the University of Melbourne, and hence her, her trip here to, the, to visit us today. But so it gives me great pleasure to introduce her to give this talk on uh, colloidal nanoparticles and magneto-optical ways of investigating them. And so thanks, Sephra. I've been very interested here also in your presentation. Yeah. Thank you. So first, thank you very much uh, for the invitation to come and visit in this institute. It was my dream for many, many years, and I, I'm very happy I finally made it. And thank you for your wonderful hostessing here. And I'm already here for a day and a half, and I'm absolutely impressed with activities and university facilities, and I bless you to continue <laughs> this way. So I wanted you to share uh, my experience with you on some of the fundamental properties in colloidal particles, how we study them uh, for quite a le length of time. But before I do that, uh, I made here a collage of many materials that I worked through the years, and you will see that there is one common denominator, and we'll start from the right side going in a clockwise. Uh, Two-dimensional materials like the multiple quantum wells, some deposition of uh, organic materials of thin films, uh, layered materials that I grow neutrally is uh, flakelets uh, like graphene, uh, which are inorganic, the inorganic analogs of these materials. And uh, I actually, uh, I worked on them many, many years ago, more than 20 years ago, and they're becoming very, very fashionable nowadays because of, indeed, because of their similarity to graphene. So doing some intercalation compounds of these materials and all study single layers. Um, and if we go all the way to the left side, we have the colloidal particles, which are zero dimensional or one dimensional materials. And this will be the focus of the talk because we have only 40 minutes or so. Um, so what are the methodology that we are using? As I say, I will discuss mainly fundamental properties uh, rather than some implementation of these materials. Uh, so we have to do some basic science in learning some of their properties. And my strongest tools are what we call magneto-optical measurements. Uh, so we either do some uh, photoluminescence I'm sorry, photoluminescence in the presence of external magnetic field, uh, or that we do a combination of magnetic resonance with optics. We call it optically detected magnetic resonance, or we do combination of cyclotron resonance measurements for conductivity, but also combined with optics. So it's all optically detected. And in the last couple of years, we made a very special effort to transport all these uh, a fancy magneto-optical methodology uh, to be able to measure a single particle. So indeed, we are doing some uh, microphotoluminescence uh, to measure only one single particle so that is actually combined also with some of these magneto-optical measurements. And we will use it and sh see some results as we go along. OK. So for colloidal particles, uh, as again, we can have different shapes, but let's focus our work, uh, our, our description today only on colloidal particles that have spherical particles, nearly spherical particles. Uh, so you know very well that there are few methodologies to prepare them around the words, and either the physical properties that are doing by deposition using uh, molecular beam at epitaxy. We will not deal with this today. But what we call wet chemistry preparation, and the one that I want to focus in particular is the colloidal particles. 
and some of you are uh, becoming experts in this campus as well, uh, but I will mention it for, for the others. We do injection of precursors into a smart solutions at elevated temperatures, so we end up with crystallization of inorganic nanoparticles. Uh, from the semiconducting materials are the 2, 6, 3, 5, 4, 5, uh, 4, 6 uh, type of materials, but they're all kept by some organic ligands. Uh, we have another methodology that we call spray methodology. I will have to ignore it from the talk due to the lack of time, uh, but this is also very, very interesting. Uh, we are preparing droplets uh, where we have a very dilute uh, a, a dissolve of solids inside it and that's how we prepare our nanoparticles. Each droplet is actually capturing enough material only for preparation of one nanoparticles, but we will have to save it for, for next time. So keeping the restriction of colloidal particles, uh, we can prepare nanoparticles of various fa families, as I said, and you probably, most of you know that the main issue of these are nanoparticles is the quantum size effect where the electronic band structure is changing as a, si as a variation of the size, also variation of the shape. Uh, so indeed we used it uh, through the years uh, for photovoltaic, common interest uh, with my friends over here, light emitting diodes, some photonics, optical switches, biological platforms, some spintronics. I'm very much interested in spin properties of these nanoparticles as you, as you will see as we go along. I don't have time to discuss all of it and I will restrict only the physical properties. Uh, of these materials and I can only show very briefly uh, nanoparticles uh, within uh, two electrodes to prepare the photovoltaic cells, uh, optical switch, a Q switch where we put the nanoparticles between to sandwich between a fabric perot cell to and within the nanoparticles works as such a <laughs> absorber. Uh, when it's saturated, it opens the gate. When it relaxes back to the ground state, it's, it uh, closes the gate. So this is like a passive Q switch. And we did some lasing with these nanoparticles to embed the nanoparticles between two bread reflectors. And we have many more, but no time to discuss it, okay? So I'm getting into uh, fundamental properties, okay? So there is one thing in common regarding all the application that I just mentioned. Definitely, if we are going to discuss photovoltaic as a common denominator between us, and there is a list of some for, uh, uh, very fundamental properties that I will cover through the talk. Don't be scared, it looks very long a uh, bit, but I think st uh, step by step we will go. So the question that I really want to put the most emphasis, I would say it's like a heading, is what are the properties that actually control the colloidal particles. We have an inner part that is an inorganic ordered crystalline material and it is covered by a capping of ligands that are soft material, disordered, and they bound at different strengths to the surface. And for many, many years, including our laboratory, uh, we mainly put a focus on the properties of the inorganic part and we were dared even to make a, a declaration that this is the dominant part of the crystals that is uh, a governing all the physical properties and I think we were wrong and what I want to show you today how severe uh, sometimes the ligands can change the physical properties of our nanoparticles and this will be the main issue of, uh, of the talk. Uh, and I think it should be uh, very relevant to what I heard in the last uh, day and a half because the ligands are always mediators somewhere in the processes, okay? So this sometimes even will uh, restrict whether we are in the size confinement in the strong, medium or weak confinement regime. We also, I think in the literature, most of the people discuss the strong confinement regime, even theoretically as well as experimentally. It's always the easier case. You have to do less work in terms of uh, theoretical understanding, but many of the ligands and uh, other properties can change it sometimes to behave like medium and weak uh, confinement, so we'll have to deal with it. So of course they will also change the electronic band structure uh, of either core or core shell materials. 
Uh, they will also affect this question of external and internal properties, the single and multiple excitons and exchange reaction and hot carrier cooling and Auger processes. So all these points that I just mentioned are really fundamental questions. Maybe people discuss them more than 20 years in the literature and we are so surprised that there are still a lot of things that are not solved all regarding all this point that I want to mention. Okay. Uh, so, uh, okay, so let's start. Uh, so, our nanoparticles covered by organic ligands. So, where, what is the role of the organic ligands? So, the first role of the organic ligands is to help to grow the nanoparticles. As I said, we are injecting into precursors, uh, uh, into solution, and the solution includes these organic ligands. And these organic ligands al always have one unique functional group, like amines, carboxyls, phosphines, and so on, uh, and so on. And they are more, more or less always the, of the kind of donor-like, donor or acceptor, that they can make some uh, chemical reaction. And they are not bound to all surfaces in the same strings. Because under the microscope, maybe the nanoparticles look spherical to us, but we have to remember that they are completely faceted, because this is single crystalline. So, for example, the 111 in cubic structure is mainly metallic in one side, one facet, and they will bound, you know, to any metallic position. But if we look on the 001 or 100 facet, we have dilution of sites of, ma of metals, okay? So less ligands are tied to the surface. So already from the very beginning, they don't have the same binding energy and the same binding strengths, you know, to different facets. So they can, for that reason, direct growth that it's not going to be spherical, but elongated and so on. Ligands also have, uh, they are molecules with electronic states. So if we think that our uh, part part uh, colloidal particles like, parti like quantum boxes that we learned in fresh freshman ke chemistry and carriers like particle in a box uh, with infinite walls, but the ligands put infinite walls. So this is an influence of the ligands already on the electronic states. Those of you that are doing some band structure calculation that like we do in our lab laboratory, very well know that if you put a finite band, all the states will have a little bit of a tuning shift. Okay, so this is also influence of the ligands. And uh, let's uh, look on some uh, uh, schematic uh, presentation. Here we have the edge of the conduction band, the surface. We have metals on the surface that have un unsatisfied uh, chemical bonds. And they can tie to amines. These are the ligands by coordination chemistry to phosphine, phosphine or phosphonic oxy, a phospho oxide with covalent bonding and uh, with carboxyl with ionic bonding. So the strengths of the ligands, how they're tied to the surface is also very different, depending on what is the functional group of the ligand. In any event, in any event, these are chemical bonds and chemical bonds have electronic states. So where are the uh, states of this binding to the surface? So if the black lines over here are the uh, valence band and conduction band states, but all these binding states, okay, they are either with, these are the red lines over here, they are either within the band gap or within the intraband. And I will tell you, for example, uh, something that I will come to it a little bit later. If we prepare hot excitons, hot carriers, and I already heard yesterday discussions of students that dream to do some extractions of carriers for photovoltaics from hot states. So you're photogenerating hot carriers, okay? You are creating hot carriers by absorption of photon, but this hot carrier has a tendency right, right away to relax, to cool down to the, what we call ground state. Uh, but this energy uh, difference between 1P and 1S is about 200 milli electron volt. There are so many arguments in the literature, whether this transition, whether this cooling is possible by, the help of internal phonons and most people say no in principle it wasn't supposed to be because it's the, the gap the energy gap is too large not in resonance at all with all the phonon the internal phonon uh, 
so th we call this, by the way, phonon bottleneck, that some of you may hear heard it or uh, came across it in the literature, that you can't go down, but in reality people didn't find in colloidal particles a uh, phonon bottleneck, and they asked themselves why. They gave some explanation on Auger processes, we'll see it in the next trans transparency, uh, but this is not a solution either, and we forgot one very important thing, we have attraction of uh, carriers also to the ligands in the surrounding and maybe some of the vibrational modes of the ligands can be in resonance. If you check the numbers, there is, oh, I'm sorry, oh, I'm sorry, very surprisingly uh, some of the vibrational modes of the ligands exactly in resonance with this 1P, 1S transition. So ligands again will influence offer us a new route for relaxation and please take it into account for those of you that are planning a, a photovoltaic cells that you may lose energy of height carriers by the attraction to the ligands and if we talk about conductivity let's say that in a solar cells you want to take a sample of nanoparticles in very ordered way so you're bringing two nanoparticles to intimate contact only up to the fact you know that you can squeeze the ligands so the ligands are in between as a mediator and, and they may even do isolation, you know, of one nanocarp to the others in terms of electricity. So this is problematic. Uh, so people uh, take a strategy to replace these nano uh, uh, ligands with the very short molecules, uh, maybe even replace them completely with something that is inorganic. But we have to remember again, it's not only the distance, it's also the fact that carriers uh, can interact with the vibrational modes of the ligands, with the degree of freedom of the ligands, and then energy can get lost, even before making any hopping to the next colloidal particle in, an, in the neighborhood, okay? So you see how the questions of how the ligands are influencing property becomes a very serious issue. Okay, and a little bit neglected in the literature. Okay, so this is the ligands, but now let's look on the internal parts. Uh, I won't go over it in details. Uh, you learned it probably for the first time that you read a paper on colloidal particles. They tell you the special things is the confinement, and when I feel the confinement, that the size of my nanoparticles is somewhere in the range of the, the volume that one uh, electron hole pair is accommodating, okay? That's what we call the uh, uh, effective Bohr radius of the exciton. Uh, so it can be smaller than this, intermediate or even weak. And what I will show you a little bit later today that not only the strong confinement is interesting, but also intermediate and, and weak confinement and also has to do something with the inter interaction with the ligands, okay? So it is just to throw a sentence to the, you know, to, to air at the moment and I'll come back to it. Okay, so and one more thing, uh, all of them I will eventually uh, uh, correlate with uh, e inorganic organic influence, okay, of the ligands and so on. So all the physical problems that I'm in introducing at the moment. One more thing to remind you about uh, most of the materials I will, uh, but I have of course to say two six materials, three five material, four four six materials don't necessarily have the same behavior, but there is one thing in common in all of them. Okay, if I'm exciting across the band gap from the edge of the valence band to the conduction band, if I say homolumo, everybody knows the concept homolumo, or only chemists know homolumo. Okay, so. But bandage, okay, we won't use homolimo. Uh, I'm creating el electron and hole, okay, a pair of electron and holes. This is uh, my exciton. Uh, this is too naive a, a presentation. Uh, a, why it's a naive presentation? Because actually it's only not only one line, okay? The state is not only one line. Because we have two carriers in this quantum box and not one and they will have interaction that we call exchange interaction. So the exchange interaction will split it uh, into the, the, com the angular momentum component. For two six materials, this is two and one. I won't go into the explanation why, because we don't have time. 
And I want to add afterwards that this is not the end of the splitting. We will have a little bit more splitting if we have some influence of what we call crystal field and maybe some distortion of shape and so on. This is important for me because all this, uh, uh, this will be the probing that I will need a little bit later to do. I will probe excitons, but excitons are not this transition, but they are some of this transition from here to the ground state. Okay, so that's important for me to explain. Okay, so now we are uh, progressing. I'm trying to speed a little bit up because I know that I can't uh, speak for too long. Uh, so, uh, my, as I said, the, 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 the mo one of the most important things to follow is actually the behavior of excitons. But when I talk uh, excitons, I don't mean only one exciton. One exciton, it's actually electron hole pair, okay, uh, the, uh, just across the band gap. But for many applications, including solar cells, but also lasers, we need inversion of population, so this is at least two ex uh, electron hole pairs, okay? And for solar cells, the more the better, okay? If I can create more than one electron hole pair, I have larger efficiency of my cell, okay? So I want multi-carriers as much as possible. So I like to discuss the bi-excitons. I have two electron hole pairs only across the band gap, but they can be bi-exciton of this kind that a little bit more spread among the uh, intraband states and three excitons of two kinds and four excitons and so on. Okay, how to prepare multiple excitons? You either do what we call sequential filling, one photon, another photon, a third photon, and so on. But you can also do what people uh, uh, raised in the last couple of years, what we call multiple exciton generation. Uh, this is also multiple exciton generation, okay? We pre prepare many exciton, but what they, the way they discuss in the literature, it's actually the creation of what we call hot exciton. It's not an exciton with an energy of the band gap, but much higher, at least twice as much, at least twice as much. And when this one uh, doesn't live for, for extended uh, period of time, relaxed to what, to what we call to the bandage uh, states, uh, this excess energy, this over here, and this excess energy, energy sometimes it's uh, sufficient to create another electron hole pair across the band gap. So on the price of one exciton, which is hot exciton, I received already two electron hole pairs. And this is like a multiplication, okay, of that's what they call. There are a lot of argument in the literature whether this is efficient or not efficient, but this is not our business for the moment. But okay, we are preparing. So we can either prepare one, or, uh, one way or another, more than one electron hole pair. Very nice, we can prepare them, but the question whether they stay for a sustained period of time, so I have enough time to separate them in a solar cell, for example. And the answer that we give, no. They don't like to live in one quantum box, in a small quantum box together. And the problem is, uh, uh, that we are undergoing Auger process, just in a word, what is an Auger process? That one electron hole annihilate non-radiatively because this energy is stolen away immediately by a third body, and this third body ex uh, converted into kinetic energy and actually is excelling to the surface uh, as if one pair of electron, one pair of uh, all uh, electron hole pair say to the other one, I apologize, there is no room for you, either me or you, and kicks one of them out, okay? Uh, so now we are left with no recombinations. The first one was lost, the photon of emission was lost, the second one was dissociated, all of a sudden I have darkness. So if we follow a photoluminescence of single particle, we see that a certain time I have emission, certain time I don't, and it goes on, uh, on, off, on, off, on, off. We call this process blinking, that some of you may know, and also exists in, in, in single molecule spectroscopy. And this was the base, basically, for super resolution that had been gained a Nobel Prize this year. Uh, and, and also another thing that happens most of the time for such a poor single particle that also is exciton is wandering around uh, and you know it's not in the same energy for the very same reason because of the Auger process. Uh, so what, what very important for me to say because remember I, I, I will come back again to all the influence of the ligands 
If we have many defects on the surface, this excelling is easier because the exciton has a place to go, okay? And it even can go outside and, and sit for a while on the ligand and then come back, okay, recover and come back in, in a diffuse bed. So again, the ligands are <laughs> accommodator, you know, of this uh, carrier, so we, we have to take it into consideration. So uh, maybe for super resolution, for single molecule spectroscopy, people learn to a very nice, in a smart way to use this blinking, but for solar energy, for light emitting diode, for lasers, this will be deleterious. We never want to have some blinking. Uh, so uh, we want to come to a situation because of the seeing the luminescence trace intensity trace of this way it will be more or less stable we even prefer that it will be more flat but this is at least not going all the way to zero so there are three solutions that are uh, offered in the literature two of which are developed in our laboratory uh, but let's start with a large one with, with the top one uh, developed by Klimov and others uh, nowadays around the world. And this is to do, of course, core shell materials and uh, a particularly to have a giant shell. And why they want giant shell? Because in giant shell we have a strong delocalization of one carrier, but on the contrary, uh, a actually focusing of another carrier. So if you create this asymmetry, in the spreading of the wave function, then uh, you will reduce the, the repulsion or attraction of many, many excitons, what we call it, many body interactions, and then immediately you are reducing some of the OG. Also, and also OG is inversely proportional to the total volume, okay? So now you also increase the total volume. So this, this is, one way, okay, to suppress some of OG. And we had another strategy is going into a core shell that in between the core and the shell, we have a buffer layer that we call it, that has a alloying composition between the core and the shell. And I will have to explain to you why it is so good. And then you don't necessarily need giant, but only in the last project that we have done that uh, um, came to the website, accepted and came to the website only maybe a week or 10, 10 days ago, is taking giant core, but then it doesn't matter what is the shell. Thin, thick, it doesn't matter. And I will tell you the benefits as we go along. Okay, uh, so I promised. Uh, okay, uh, one thing that will be for your interest. Uh, so here we are basing everything on not only on core materials, but we call heterostructures, core shell materials. We have to, uh, and this is not something new, people are doing core shell materials nearly for 30 years. Only one problem. Uh, you're taking two different semiconductors and instead of having external defects, you may now create internal defects because sometimes they mismatch each other. Okay, uh, how do we know? And this is for your interest, I think, and maybe I take a word to say about it. Uh, we do, as I promised you, what we call magneto-optical measurements, but here it's a little bit more sophisticated. We do what we call magnetic resonance measurements at the excited state. And magnetic resonance uh, measurements at the excited state tells us who you are and who are your neighbor. Are you electron? Are you hole? Are you trapped in the core, in the interface, or in the shell? Okay? So how we, and who you are and who are your neighbors, okay? Uh, so that's why we use this method and only a word how we do it. This is the edge of the valence band. This is the conduction band and I prepared the electron in hole and one of the carriers got trapped. Let's say example the electron and now this uh, electron that had been trapped for me, it's unpaired spin that I can do magnetic resonance. So I'm applying external magnetic field I'm bringing a microwave and I'm changing the position of this uh, orientation of the spin. And this is a magnetic resonance effect, but I'm not measuring it directly like you do in NMR and ESR, but I'm measuring how it is influenced the intensity afterwards of the emission down to the ground state. Therefore, I call it optically detected magnetic resonance. Uh, so when it comes down, the selection changed a little bit because I made perturbation 
at the excited state. So I'm plotting this uh, change in luminescence intensity as a function of magnetic resonance parameter, like a strength of external magnetic field, and receive a spectrum that looks like NMR or ESR. And then I can interpret this as I do for magnetic resonance. Okay, I won't go into the details of the system, so only around examples, uh, this is how the spectrum looked like, and the interpretation of this spectrum was that I had what we call between boundary, when you take core and shell, and they, there is a loss of strain, okay, between them, because they, they have missed crystallographic uh, parameter, so because of the strain they do folding. And, and they prepare uh, what we call twin boundaries, so a lot of defects along this thread, or that they have edge dislocation, so this is one case, or that I put ligands like tiles, and uh, sulfur has not one electron hole, uh, 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 not one pair of uh, electrons, but can donate many electrons, so to keep a counterbalance, the lattice will lose uh, one atom uh, create like a vacancy, so I, I managed to identify this vacancy. Okay, I'm just giving you two examples of what I, I can measure and identify many defects, okay, in our core shell materials. And no doubt, this is extremely useful information when we are discussing photovoltaic cells and you want to know where your carriers are getting lost, okay? In all these defects, they will get lost. Okay, so if you can identify it completely, this is very nice. Sorry for the moment. Um, okay, I promised to, sh to tell you why core aloe shells are so uh, interesting and how they are suppressing Auger. So here is the explanation here, over here. Let's go back, what is Auger? Auger is actually, f f always, okay, no matter for where, where I'm describing it, is actually ejection of carrier from the most lowest energy to a remote place. Can be even outside the lattice, but very, very high electronic state. When in, in particle in a box, you learned uh, first in freshman chemistry that the first level, uh, the, the wave function of the carriers looks like a half sign, but in a very, very remote state, it has many nodes. Uh, you must have very good overlap of wave functions to go from 2 to 4 here, what I label 2 to 4. Uh, ha, ha, this is Fermi, uh, Fermi Golden Rule, okay? If I have good, a good overlap, this will happen. And I don't want Auger to happen, I don't want any ejective care, so I have to block this, this uh, route. How do I block it? Under number 2 over here, uh, if I do Fourier transform, I have many, many, many high frequency components. These high frequency components overlap the high frequency components of number 4. So that's why I have a good way to go up, that the carriers will go up. So I need to kill high frequency components that are sitting under the envelope number two. And the way to do it, you look over here, uh, is instead of having a well that has a very sharp, sharp, sharp uh, transition, I will make it softer and softer and softer. And this is exactly is, is being done by making alloying materials. It's like making core shell, 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 and gradually you are changing the chemical composition of the sequence of the shells. So it's not only important to have alloying composition, but graded allo alloying composition. Okay, so indeed our calculation showed that uh, you see that I'm declining all the time. This is the rate of Auger and becomes lower and lower as my gradient is larger and larger. Okay, so I kill by this Auger, and materials are Auger free, and they will be blinking free. No blinking, okay, we'll have to prove it. Okay, only one thing, uh, because of discussions that we had yesterday, if we are making core shell materials, this is an example that we made core shell materials between PV sulfide and PV selenide, or vice versa, okay? Not only uh, by alloying composition, we are killing Auger, but we are also doing slight tuning, okay, of the electronic states. So this is, for example, going from a PV selenide, and I put a PV sulfide on top of it as a core shell, 
but not completely pure PV sulfide, but gradually I change the grading, okay? So you see that there is an inclination over here and all electronic states are moving. Okay, by the way, we do all these calculations ourselves. Okay, so now, um, good. With less than 10 minutes, I hope to, to be able to make my point, right? That's more or less what I have, right? Uh, okay, so now I want to show you that indeed the materials that I'm claiming that I suppressed to by this trick of using alloy composition or even giant uh, cores, which I didn't say anything about it, but you will see as the result as we go along. So let's take a set of materials that either they are very small, but they have the alloy composition, they will still suppress to completely, or that they are very large with a large core and they will also suppress to Okay. Let's skip this because we don't have time. Uh, so uh, uh, what is the system that I'm working? Uh, the, the experimental setup, we also do a sample measurement. We're taking many nanoparticles in solution and we measure them. We usually do everything at cryogenic uh, temperatures. Uh, time resolve continues, you know, everything we do. But what I want to show you selectively is only the measurements on single nanoparticles. So we embed everything in cryogenic systems. We have a superconducting magnet up to one system, eight Tesla, another system, 12 Tesla. And we have a probe, all these, the red one, including these items over here are sitting on a probe that we are embedding inside a cryostat that looks like NMR with a big magnet, okay? So we are embedding a probe this is a confocal probe. At the edge of it, we have a piezoelectric XYZ, so we can move the nanoparticles with respect to the beam or vice versa, okay? Uh, if we want to do magnetic resonance, then I have a microwave cavity over here. Sometimes we take this microwave cavity away, so we only put the nanoparticles on a microscope slide. So this is our nanoparticles, and we even have a tip of AFM that we can sometimes functionalize this tip to do some perturbation to those nanoparticles. Uh, so either one of them is sitting over here and all the red one is actually the confocal uh, arrangement, laser through a beam splitter that excite the nanoparticles. On the same line we are with another beam splitter we are detecting by a CCD or taking into the side to do a, what we call photon correlation measurements in order to measure the anti-bunching. I don't know if you all know what it is, but if you don't, I apologize, I don't have time to explain it, okay? Uh, this is a very important experiment to for check for ourselves that we are studying only one single nanoparticle, okay? And it's also very important for people that are designing this or want to use these nanoparticles as a single photon light source. And this is type of experiment that they are doing. Okay, so uh, so that's how we are doing the experiment, okay. So this is probably a situation that we don't want to see. I'm just bringing it to show you what is the difference between a materials that blinks and doesn't blink. So the uh, materials that blinks, you see we have a lot of jumps, uh, nearly to zero, and also wandering of the signal, it's not very good. We want flat, you know, no changes, neither intensi intensity, not in position of the lines. And these are some results that prove that indeed we can do so. So let's uh, look on the left side. We have uh, a series of uh, single dot measurements when we use the uh, different strengths of laser excitation. And you see that we have a gradual, all of them have multi-lines. They are associated with multiple excitons, one exciton, two exciton, three exciton, four exciton, and so on. For example, the first one is a single exciton. It goes, grows linearly with the intensity of the laser. That means that always one photon is absorbed. And the second one already grows quadratically. That means that it's two, exit, two photons have been absorbed and the, all the others are super linear, that means that they are creating three excitons, four excitons, and so on. But it's probably, at the time we record this, a few years ago, it was probably the first proof of CW experiment. That means that the bi-exciton, three exciton, four exciton don't die for a length of time, so I can do CW experiment. So at least they live nanosecond or so, okay? Contrary to many others that I d that had OJ processes were not suppressed, 
and then they die in a picosecond, three picosecond, five picosecond, and so on. So no, nobody could see them in a CW experiment. Uh, so this is very nice. All the lines over here are only less, maybe 300, 400 microelectron volt in width. So the resolution is very, very high. And please remember the side bands that we have here, some side bands. Each one of them have some side bands, but also here. And in a few minutes, I will tell you that they are related to vibrational modes of the ligands. Okay? <laughs> Uh, you, you won't be surprised because I'm aiming to it all the time. Okay, uh, for giant uh, core with a very, very thin shell, we received the same results. I'd only spread this region over here wide, over here. Okay, it's only expanded scale, so they are also very, very narrow, but we have one linear, super linear, and so on. So we're getting nearly in, the, in, in even when we have a weak confinement regime, we can get very similar results also to the strong confinement regime. We still can generate, that's very surprising, because when they are large, we by the volume, we are already reducing by an order of magnitude of J processes, or two order of magnitude, and, and they can still have a very interesting excitonic effects, which it's nice. Okay, so here is uh, some of these giant shells uh, again. Uh, and you see that they are nearly not blinking, and this is the exciton, and the red one over here will be two excitons, and the green one over here, three excitons. We made some theoretical calculation how they should change as a function of the laser power, and also did calculation on the binding energy. Everything fits the experiment, to make a long story short. But now what more, most of it, we'll skip this one, was more interesting, uh, that now we can follow really all what we call fine structure. You remember that I gave you a graph, a diagram, that the excitons are not naively two layers. Okay, they split by the exchange interaction, they split by crystal field, okay? And of course, once they split, they become uh, very selective in terms of their spin orientation. So we can really prove it now, but only because I have such a superb spectral resolution on widths of lines that are three or four hundred microelectron volt, okay, it says four orders of magnitude better than if I would study a sample of man material. Okay, so let's see an example of one of them. This is the exciton by exciton, the third exciton, let's leave it out for the moment. I'm expanding this regime, putting external magnetic field, and started to measure whether to examine whether they are linearly polarized or circularly polarized transition. So you see that I have a zero magnetic field to uh, two orientation. This was supposed to be one band if I do it unpolarized, but if I do parallel and perpendicular to a certain direction uh, of the external magnetic field, I have really difference between the two polarization. And as I go up to a higher uh, external magnetic field, uh, I won't have any more linear polarization, but it starts to be circularly polarized, okay? Where it comes from? You remember this drawing of the exciton? I have also a plot of the bi-exciton, but we will have to make a long story short, so let's only analyze the exciton. You remember that I said that even without external magnetic field, we'll have two electron hole, uh, two states with different uh, angular momentum projections, okay? and they further split, but not all of these states are actually emitting to the ground state uh, because of selection rules, okay? The angular momentum plus minus two can't go to the ground state, it's forbidden, okay? The light can take only plus minus one, okay? So the only one that emits to the ground state is the plus minus one, and if I put now external magnetic field, I split it into the sigma plus and sigma minus. So that's why when I increase the external magnetic field, I had selective transitions which are circularly polarized. People in spin electronics, spintronics, quantum information devices just love this selectivity. Okay, that means spin oriented spin in one direction, oriented spin in another direction. This is a binary language. <laughs> Okay, either one direction or another direction, okay? 
but only if I don't have external magnetic field or very weak external magnetic field, then the separation, the plus, plus one and minus one, mix them to, they are so close, they mix together, so they lose their good quantum numbers, so they mix, and because of the mixing, they have linear polarization. So I can explain all the e experimental phenomenon. Okay, uh, that I have this pol linear polarization and circular polarization, but this is very, very important. Okay, so I have to I apologize, I can't say more. And one more thing, uh, if I plot now the splitting of the circular polarization, uh, these are no more than just this splitting will be a Zeeman effect. Zeeman effect is linear dependence on the external magnetic field, but also the quadratic uh, comes into pronunciation. So for that reason, for some of the samples, particularly the larger one, they are bending, you see, they are not straight lines. So I can extract the coefficient of this one. This is called the G factor. G factor, it's a phenomenological parameter, but it's very similar to effective mass. So like effective mass always tells us something about valence and conduction band, their slope and so on, characteristic of the valence and conduction band, G factor is the same. Okay, so for me, which I can say, what are the league, what are these e electronic states uh, combined from s orbital, a p orbital, and so on? I can do this relationship. And the other parameter that is very, very important, I have only two transparencies. Okay, to finish, is is this diamagnetic shift? Uh, this parameter over here, this gamma over here, it's correlated with the radius of the exciton. So this parameter tells me. Uh, that actually for giant score, for giant score, what is doing the confinement, it's not the spacing, but the fact that their own column interaction keeps them only at the center of these nanoparticles. Uh, I must say a comment, it's we're not going to be good for solar cells because that means that the, carri the carriers are not coming to the surface to extract, but it's perfect for lasing. Okay, light emitting diode. So not everything is good for everything. Okay, and last, 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 uh, you see that if I expand, you remember the side bands that I wanted to show you? So here I expanded the side bands and we have a strong fingerprint of the vibrational modes. Some of the side bands that I paid your attention before are indeed fingerprints of the vibration mode of the ligands. That means that I have a loss of energy from the exciton, from the zero phonon line, and some energy is lost due to resonant transfer into the vibrational modes of the ligands. Okay, And I proved it by changing the type of ligands or putting a spacer that disconnects this uh, transport of energy. Okay. So I had one more topic, but maybe I cut, okay? Yeah. Because no, it's only one transparency that's showing uh, transport measurements uh, of a di between two nanoparticles, just isolating, let's say, two out of these uh, solar cells. Let's say that the solar cell has only two, two of them. And we do scanning talenic spectroscopy when we inject carrier into one, and we see how the ligand is influencing the transport to the second one. So this is also a very interesting study that we did to close the cycles that ligands are influencing optics, but they're also influencing electrical properties. Okay, so we'll, I will cut uh, just to say that I want you to say today that, uh, I apologize, uh, here, uh, that blinking free materials is a must for anything you do in terms of optoelectronics, okay? Uh, you can achieve it by very elegant uh, core shell materials. Some of them are extremely good for solar cells, some of them maybe... We, we can discuss it in person, some of these alloying materials, because we are killing Auger processes. Uh, we have uh, knowledge now how the ligands are influencing, but we can discuss how to get rid of it also, like putting chlorine, bromine, which I know some of you are doing already, or at least spacers, you know, that get rid of it. And in general, this really influences both optical and, and uh, electrical properties. So once we know the problem, we will know how to solve it. So thank you for your attention. And uh, I finished it too, but uh, I can take probably questions outside if we have to, to get out of the room.
So thank you for your attention.